Okay, so we're a quarter of the way through 2024 already, if you can believe it. And you know what that means? It's time for another one of these quarterly update videos where I go through all the movies that I watched this time through the months of January to March. And I apologize in advance because this is going to be kind of a long one. I've somehow already watched like 200 movies this year and not to brag, but like I'm not even trying. Less in a braggy way, but more in a confused way. I don't even know how I've done it. That being said, some of these are shorts, but not that many. And some of these are stand-up comedy specials, so you can view some of these as cheats, I guess. But they're all on Letterboxd, and that's my hard and fast rule. If they're on Letterboxd, they count as a film. So it's about as simple as that. Let's get talking movies. First up, starting off with the category movies I saw in cinemas. And the first movie I saw in cinemas this year was Next Goal Wins, Taika Waititi's latest about the American Samoa soccer team who had a historic loss against Australia. I believe it was 31 to nil. That being said, that's not what this movie is about. That event had already happened in the events of this movie, and it's really a movie about their redemption arc following that, which I thought was a bit disappointing. I felt a bit duped about that because I thought it was going to be about that loss. But that being said, for what it is, it's just a fun, feel-good sports comedy movie, and it's fine. But a bunch of people have been complaining about this movie, saying that it's like a huge disappointment coming from Taika Waititi, which I don't really understand because it feels like pretty much every one of his other movies to me. I thought it was okay. I'm that being said, I'm not the biggest fan of Taika Waititi. You know, does it great because of his constant need to be funny? Sure, but that's Taika Waititi for you. You know what I mean? Like, I don't really understand why this one's any different from any of the other ones. I thought it was fine. Anyway, next up, I watched Night Swim. And funny story about this movie, it was kind of an accident when I saw it because I went to the movies intending to watch Godzilla Minus One, but it was sold out. I didn't pre-book tickets. What a mistake. And so when I was there, I'm just like, fine, I guess I'll settle for Night Swim. But that being said, for what it is, and if you don't know what it is, it's a horror movie about a haunted pool. And yes, despite how dumb that sounds, this is kind of an okay movie. You know, it's just like a generic average horror movie, but I had fun watching it as I always do with horror movies in cinemas, you know? Next up, I watched Godzilla Minus One. And yeah, this movie is pretty awesome. Though that being said, I'm really not as high on it as everybody else is. Because I saw this movie like a few weeks or maybe even a couple months after everybody else did. I saw this one pretty late. And so I've been hearing nothing but positive, 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 crazy things about just how amazing this movie is for a long time before I saw it. And I ended up seeing it and just thought that it was like a pretty good Godzilla movie. Like I went in thinking it was going to change my life or something, but it was just like a good movie. I don't know. I didn't think it was that insanely good, but you know, it was pretty impressive, especially when considering the budget and the special effects. I also like that this movie is basically about teamwork. It's sort of wholesome. It's about the people working together to bring down their adversary. And it's sort of nice in a weird way. That being said, something did happen near the end of this movie. I won't say what it is because spoilers, but it's a reveal that somebody survived something. And when that happened, I just called bullshit. There's no way. But you know, I can't really get into it without spoiling. <laughs> Godzilla minus one is pretty good. I just don't think it's as good as everybody's been saying. Next up, I watched The Iron Claw, which I cannot believe did not win Best Picture at the Oscars. It got like no nominations. It was not recognized at all. I don't understand it. This movie is absolutely phenomenal, incredible in every single way. Yes, it's very sad and tragic. And so with that, you can accuse it maybe of being a bit melodramatic. But when you consider that this is based on a true story and they actually pulled back the tragedy to make the movie feel a bit more believable because the sadness of the true story is just that weird and unbelievable. Like it's a strange than fiction scenario here. And so when you take that into consideration, you really can't complain about how sad this movie is. It's what happened. And it's very sad and it's great, you know? It's very emotional. I think it's fantastic. Yes, Zac Efron does look very ridiculous in this movie. Fun fact, they based his body off of my physique. Then I watched a movie called The Dry 2, which is a sequel to an Australian mystery cop drama type of thing that came out a few years ago. And like police procedural type of things isn't really my genre, but I do think that these ones are pretty good. This sequel has sort of a survival element added to it as well. So I actually think I enjoyed it more than the first one. Uh, these movies star Eric Banner and I do think he does a good job, but his character, I believe Aaron Forks, you know, he isn't the most interesting character. You could say that he's a little dry, but <laughs> the mystery revolving around him is enough to go by. And I do think that these are pretty good. Then I watched Argar, which is a movie that a bunch of people have been complaining about being not that good and I don't really get it. I kind of think that Matthew Vaughn knocked it out of the park. He did what he does. He made another one, you know? 
know? This feels like a Kingsman movie. I had fun with it. What I really liked about it is that it like has basically like insane plot twists and reveals and stuff. And like every second scene, you never know where it's going. It's hella fun. And I never use the word hella, but that's just what Argyle did to me. You know, it made me find parts of me that I didn't know was there before. Now that's an exaggeration, but <laughs> but yeah, I had, I had fun with this movie. You can call it convoluted, I guess, but it's a silly spy movie. Don't take it that seriously. That's, that's my advice. Then I watched Madam Web and boy, do I have some things to say about Madam Web. I don't think it's that bad? I don't think that this movie is like so bad it's good. I don't think it's as much of a meme as everybody's been making it out to be. I think it's just like a pretty generic fine superhero movie. It didn't blow my mind. It's not fantastic. I would never say that it's incredible or anything but it's okay. I don't really understand all the hate and, and the laughing at it and stuff. It's just like a fine movie I guess. It's like a two and a half three star movie to me. Maybe I'm just going crazy but if you do want to twist it in a certain way and make it sound awesome you can because the elements are there. This is a movie about a woman protecting these three girls from an unstoppable killer as she has Final Destination type premonitions of their deaths, though not nearly as violent as Final Destination, but it's kind of cool. But basically, yeah, it's the Terminator as this killer is trying to get to them, but the Terminator in this case, the villain is an evil Spider-Man. It's kind of cool, man. That being said, sure, when the villain takes his mask off and he begins to speak, you can see that every one of his lines is ad-libbed and it is hilarious, I'll give you that. This movie's definitely flawed, okay? He he has full sentences where his mouth is not moving. It's so stupid. But I still think that this movie is acceptable, I suppose. Something else I wanted to comment on was everybody was making fun of that line where she says something like her mum was studying spiders in the Amazon rainforest before she died, right? And yes, it sounds silly when you say it out loud like that, sure. But that's what happened. <laughs> the mum was studying spiders in the Amazon rainforest and died when that happened. How else do you phrase it where it doesn't sound stupid? Like, it's a stupid thing. It's a comic book movie. It's a bit silly, right? But that's what happened. Anyway, whatever. I'm, I'm, mo I'm moving off of Madam Web now. Next, I saw a movie in cinemas that was admittedly much better in Late Night with the Devil. And this is a horror movie which basically takes place in real time within a late night talk show. And so basically we are watching like this long lost hidden tape where something went horribly wrong. And it's one of the most creative horror movies that I've seen in years and I absolutely love it. Now we're up to the next category which is 2024 movies I watched at home. First up is Pete Davidson Turbo Fonzarelli. This is a stand-up special and I didn't think it was really that good if I'm being honest. I don't think he's a great joke writer or anything like that but he somehow skates by just because he's so fucking likable. It's kind of a cheat and I sort of hate it but the dude's so chill that I can watch him talk for an hour even if the jokes are shit. Then I watched Society of the Snow which if you don't know what that is because you've been living under a rock it's that movie about the the soccer team who has their plane crash in the Andes, I think the place is called. It's the snowy mountain somewhere. And eventually they have to resort to cannibalism to survive. It's based on a true story and it's absolutely harrowing. And it's a really, really great film. Though that being said, I have a controversial take about the cannibalism, I suppose, in that I didn't think that part was that horrific. Cause it's like when you're in that situation, what else are you gonna do? Food is food in that context. You know what I mean? If I'm in that situation, I die. I give everybody permission to eat me. It's fine. <laughs> I don't know. Then I watched Self-Reliance, which is a Jake Johnson movie about a guy who is basically in this like death game where people are coming to try and kill him. But if he is in the presence of literally anybody else, like he is with another person, then they're not allowed to kill him. So basically he has to be social, which sounds kind of like a nightmare to somebody with social anxiety like me. But yeah, it's kind of an interesting movie. Definitely not as much of a horror thriller as it sounds like. Given the premise, it's more of a lighthearted comedy and it's all right. Then I watched a movie called Destroy All Neighbors, which is a really weird horror comedy that is way over the top and violent and stuff and really really funny and pretty pretty great to be honest. Um, this is about a guy who basically keeps getting in tr into trouble because he keeps accidentally killing people but then the people that he kills kind of become like these undead ghouls and follow him around. They're not mad at him they kind of become his dead friends or something and it's super silly and stuff but that being said I also was like emotionally connected to this movie for some reason in a very unexpected way. I didn't go into this thinking mm, yeah this definitely looks emotional you know what I mean but unfortunately I guess I saw myself in the protagonist quite 
quite a bit especially with his personal problems in like blaming other people for his problems and stuff like that I just I could relate to a lot of it and so I feel like this movie was really elevated for me for those sorts of reasons I don't think that was intended I think I'm the only one that watches this movie that way but it made me really appreciate it and yeah it's just kind of cool the whole thing is based on like prog rock metal music as well which is kind of cool so it's definitely got like a specific attitude to it and it's definitely for a very specific type of audience this is not a crowd pleaser that's going to be for everyone but if you are the person that sort of matches with it you're gonna love it then i watched a movie called he went that way which stars zachary quinto sidler from heroes that's what i know him as and jacob alordi you know the guy that you probably think is hot from euphoria he also played elvis in priscilla but i haven't seen that anyway this movie is basically about a serial killer who takes a ride from a random guy who's hitchhiking and they go on a road trip together and they sort of bond they sort of become friends but there's also sort of a hostage situation going on between them as well it's kind of weird for that reason but it's definitely not as interesting as it sounds this movie is just not that good and it's a huge disappointment given that premise which does sound really interesting then i watched assembled the marvels which is the disney plus special they've been making this assembled series about every single one of the mcu movies since endgame and so basically yeah it's just a behind the scenes thing i do think that they sugarcoat things a little bit they disney fire it you know everything's happy go lucky there was no trouble on set or anything like that no issues with the production it's just fun 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 and i'm sure that it's not quite like that in reality but it's still interesting sort of learning about the making of a film of course of course they also don't show the common theory that this isn't exactly the movie that the director wanted to make given her past in making the Candyman remake this is like an, a director with something important to say and you can see sprinkles and nuggets of that within the marvels where like there's this one scene where they're fleeing from planet and a bunch of people are killed and captain marvel's basically like we can't save everyone we just have to do what we can and you know there's a bit of moral grayness there that i think marvel as a studio was kind of trying to hide away from anyway uh, now i'm talking about the marvels and not assembled the marvels at the moment so i'm just gonna move on next up i watch grounded 2 which is the making of the last of us 2 we go on a ride with neil Druckmann, the director at the company of naughty dog and watch the making of this game which if you don't know is a very controversial game a lot of people hate it when it came out the internet was an ugly horrible place to be personally i am a huge fan of this game but it did take me a while i admit when i first played it i was really on the fence i wasn't sure how to feel about it it made me angry it made me like disappointed there's there's a lot to it where it's like what the fuck are you doing but then you actually play through it and if you are a mature person you can see it for what it is and what it's trying to do and i think it's an ingenious game anyway that's the game the behind the scenes documentary here was okay <laughs> then i watched a couple stand-up specials firstly there's taylor tomlinson have it all her netflix special i think she's a great comedian this one was as good as all her other stuff then i watched jack whitehall settle down which is another stand-up special that i thought was atrocious this is like so painfully unfunny i do not understand why people like this or like this guy i don't think that is very good sorry and this stand-up special in particular he's got like this whole stadium of people watching him laughing at everything that he says and i'm like these jokes are shit are you crazy <laughs> i just i don't get it i don't get the appeal i i didn't think it was very funny okay and it was kind of infuriating to me but hey comedy is subjective and so i guess that's the explanation then i watched american fiction which is a fantastic movie about a black author who isn't exactly that popular because he writes boring educational books but one day he decides to really play things up and play things from this persona that he makes up which is like this black thug kind of character and he really plays up the black experience he's on the streets he's from the hood you know even though this is a very well educated straight laced man he plays this character and he makes it as stereotypical stereotypically black as he can and basically all of the white people in the film eat it up even though he wrote it sort of ironically like basically satirical of a lot of fiction that comes out about dramatizing black people's lives but all of the dumb white people love it and think that it's very true and real to life even though they don't have any idea of what they're talking about and it's just very funny in that way and i really appreciate it i think the protagonist is really well written and well acted by jeffrey wright in particular one of my favorite protagonists from a movie i've watched recently and yeah it's just a very funny very good movie highly recommend it then i watched the beekeeper with my dad uh this is a jason statham action movie it wouldn't be one that i would have chosen to watch myself but my dad loves jason statham i'm like let's watch it 
together, man. I called my dad man, I guess. <laughs> um, and we watched it. And when it ended, I, I turned over to him and I'm like, that was so dumb and I loved it. <laughs> I loved it so much. It's like, it's such a silly movie because, okay, Jason Statham is a spy, right? And like, they all have these sort of code names where they are beekeepers, the particular spies in this movie. So he is a beekeeper spy, but he's also a beekeeper? Like he keeps bees. He's an actual beekeeper. That's so funny. And he kills some people in like bee related ways. And then like he has to come after like the main bad guys because they're the queen of the hive or whatever. <laughs> and there's this one part where some of the bad guys kill some of his bees and he has to get revenge. It's all bee related. It's so dumb. And look, I'm exaggerating a little bit. They really do kind of drop the whole bee thing a little bit, but like it's still there, you know? <laughs> and I appreciate it. Also, Josh Hutchinson plays like this crypto douche kind of character and he's quite funny in that role as well. I just think it's kind of great and it's a hell of a lot more crazy than I was expecting to. There's even a minigun at one point. Then I watched a movie called Lover Stalker Killer, which is a true crime documentary on Netflix that I thought was okay. Then I watched Land of Bad, a Liam Neeson war movie with Russell Crowe playing as this drone pilot who's basically explaining to him where to go to survive, you know, the situation that he's found himself in behind enemy lines. And basically it's an interesting movie because we watched the horrific stuff going on with Liam Hemsworth as he's like getting tortured by the enemy and all this sort of stuff. But then we see the juxtaposition with Russell Crowe struggling with personal issues like going supermarket shopping and dealing with his co-workers watching a football game instead of working. Those are his biggest problems in his life. And it is kind of a funny comparison. Then I watched Roadhouse, the Jake Gyllenhaal new remake Roadhouse movie. And it's dumb, sure, but what were you expecting, I guess? I do really like that the protagonist played by Jake Gyllenhaal basically is like this, this badass. Every single scene is there to sell him on being as cool and badass and tough as possible. And so basically because of that, he has license to be smug to literally every single person. And like, it's kind of hilarious for that reason. I really enjoy it. Plus Conor McGregor's in this movie and it's kind of weird because he's like smiling his way through the whole role. And Post Malone is in it. <laughs> I'm like, what? Why is Post Malone in this movie? I don't know, but I saw that him and Jake Gyllenhaal posted on Instagram before the movie came out. I'm like, damn, it's like two of my favorite people. I gotta watch this movie now. I really like Post Malone. He's only in one scene, but like, I don't know. It was kind of cool seeing him in a movie. But yeah, this movie's dumb, but it's okay. Then I watched Ricky Stanicki talking about dumb. <laughs> Ricky Stanicki is definitely a movie that I watched. And I guess that's about all that I have to say about it. I don't know. It was okay, but it's definitely not a movie that I'm going to remember, you know, in like 10 years. I'm going to look back and I'm going to be like, Ricky Stanicki? The fuck is that? Oh yeah, that movie. I remember thinking it was okay. <laughs> you know, it's one of those sorts of movies. Then I, I watched an indie horror movie called Stop Motion, which is about a woman making a stop motion film, but her like stop motion creatures and characters begin to haunt her. And with that being said, I actually found this pretty disappointing. Yeah, the stop motion effects is definitely fun to watch and like really creative and everything. But apart from that, I didn't think that this movie had much to say beyond its gimmick. This felt like it was really trying a bit too hard to be part of like the elevated horror genre. It was a bit pretentious in that way, but I don't think it really earned it. And instead it just came off as a pretty generic horror film that I didn't think was that good, unfortunately. Then I watched The Spider Within, a Sony Spider-Verse short that they just uploaded to YouTube like a few days ago. Basically, this is a horror movie, sort of, where it deals with Miles Morales dealing with anxiety, pretty much, as he's like seeing visions of like this shadowy figure following him and spiders and stuff. And it's kind of cool. It's got like, like, like very creative animation, of course, given its sources and everything. That being said, I don't know if the sort of horror dark approach really suits the Spider-Verse stuff. That's not really what I'm seeking from that brand. You know, this really lacked the comedy that I like from these movies. And so it was a bit disappointing for that reason, I'll say. But you know, it's only seven minutes long. So there's only so much that can be said. There's only so much that can be done. I don't think that it had anything of real importance to say, but I guess I appreciate that it's trying to sort of explore an important topic like mental health and stuff. That being said, I didn't think the depiction of it was that great. This was more like a depiction of like schizophrenia or something like that, as is having like full on hallucinations. In my experience, that's not exactly what anxiety is, but maybe that's how other people deal with it. Plus, this is an animated movie. It's a metaphor. So you can't take it too literally, I suppose. But 
Anyway, I do think it was mostly well done. But again, it's only seven minutes. I've basically talked about it for the length that it even is at this point. So let's move on. Then next up, I watched Imaginary, Blumhouse's latest horror film, which I thought was okay during its final act. The first two thirds of this movie though is pretty boring generic horror stuff and just not that good. By the third act though, they do enter this like imagination world where anything can happen. And it is quite cool. I, I do really enjoy that part if I'm being honest, but by the time the movie actually got there it was a bit too little too late and I didn't love it overall. Okay now we're up to the next category which is older movies and there are a hundred of these so get ready. These are movies that came out prior to 2024 so even if it was just last year or if it was from the 70s or whatever they're all in this category. I don't think I watched any movies from the 70s but you get my point. First up I watched Past Lives which I wasn't as crazy about this movie as everybody else has been lately. I thought that it was kind of like this pointless exploration of what could have been in the face of a loving partner. I thought it was kind of cruel, the situation that the protagonist finds herself in, in that way. And I just thought that it was a movie that was interesting. It had an interesting premise, but I also thought that uh, they were very, very heavily leaning on asking this question of what if this happened when that what if scenario didn't happen? And I'm kind of like, what's the point of asking? It didn't happen. Go from there, you know? And that's not how most people watch this movie. And I'm not trying to say this from an ignorant viewpoint I tried to get into this and I it, I did it affected me emotionally I'll even say but I just thought that this was basically a movie full of overthinking and look look babe I'm the queen of overthinking okay like I, I I'm being a total hypocrite by complaining that, they, that these characters were overthinking I admit but there was just something about it that felt immature actually and everybody was going on about how this is a very human story and I just thought it was uh I'm not sure I just didn't connect with it as much as everybody else did then I watched Maestro, Bradley Cooper's new movie about a music conductor man, I don't remember his name, and I don't know what music conductors do. It's like, don't the musicians practice beforehand? Don't they already know what they're playing? I feel like the dude waving his arms around, it's not going to make that much of a difference, right? Music is all about timing and, and, and practice, rehearsal, you know? Like, they already know the songs that they're playing. What's the conductor doing? I don't get it. Anyway, that's all I have to say about the movie. Then I watched a movie called Hunger, which is about a woman who starts working in a restaurant and it's a bit dark and that I guess that's how I can explain it right it's all about class difference it's very similar to like parasites and the platform but it's not nearly as good as any of these sorts of movies it's not as good as the menu it's not as good as ratatouille it's not as good as I don't know burnt that's another chef movie it's not as good as chef it's just it's okay and I thought that was a bit disappointing because I thought it sounded pretty good then I watched dream scenario which is a Nicolas Cage movie about a guy dealing with everybody around him seeing him in his dream and he basically becomes sort of a celebrity to everybody around him. And the movie's ultimately about what that does to somebody, getting that sudden fame, and then when things go wrong and they start to turn on him, how scary that can be. The public knowledge of who this guy is. He, he loses his privacy. And it's all about publicity and the scariness of the public eye, sort of. And I thought it was really interesting in that way. And very funny, as when things do go wrong, Nicolas Cage's character frantically tries to solve his issues, but constantly just makes things worse and worse. It's a really funny journey to go on and it's definitely a really creative movie. But it also is pretty ridiculous as it gets to the point where later on they start like advertising in people's dreams. It's definitely very satirical but yeah. It's great. Anyway, then I watched a movie called All My Friends Hate Me, which in my opinion is the best depiction I've ever seen of like anxiety and social anxiety and self-doubt and all those sorts of mental health issues in a film that I've ever seen. This movie is basically about a guy hanging out with his friends for the weekend, but it's all about him constantly taking things the wrong way. Somebody says something that sounds sort of offensive maybe or slightly mean or whatever, and it's taken out of context where he takes it really, really personally. And it basically makes him worry about like ruining their relationship relationship or it ruins his entire night. It's basically just about the main character doubting everybody around him as everybody kind of turns on him one by one. It's a very exaggerated depiction of everybody basically being mean to him but it can be interpreted many different ways where it's like they're not really being mean to him. It's just all coming from his perspective where he's looking at it a bit too much and taking things a bit too seriously. And I very much related to it. I thought it was very interesting. That being said this movie is sort of advertised as like a horror movie. It's not really though. It's 
it's more of a dramedy so just be aware of that going in then i watched a movie called digging for fire which is another jake johnson movie with a great cast brie larson and anna kendrick and even sam rockwell shows up in this movie but kind of sucks <laughs> despite that then i watched i used to be famous which is about a guy who used to be in a famous boy band who has since like fell off fell out of the public eye and is trying to build himself back up as a popular musician once more and it's just like a feel good music kind of movie then i watched shazam 2 which i thought was pretty shitty to be honest and it's really disappointing because i love the director david f sandberg who made lights out and annabelle creation and a bunch of youtube shorts um not youtube shorts shorts on youtube short films on youtube yeah he's a great director but he's been really wasting his time with these stupid shazam movies it's like what are you doing dude i get it they're big blockbusters he's probably making a ton of money off it but it's a bit disappointing that that's the direction he's going in but now that the dceu is over maybe he can get back to the horror genre i hope so then i watched the holdovers which is another movie that everybody's going nuts about and i just don't get it i don't see it man this movie is perfectly fine i don't have anything bad to say about it in particular i just like i just don't get why it's that great <laughs> it's okay then i watched a movie called theater camp which is about a theater camp and i thought this movie was really just like nauseating like it was just irritating there was something about it it was constantly trying to be funny but it was just more annoying than anything i feel mean saying that but i don't know i didn't like it. then i watched indiana jones and the dial of destiny i watched this one with my parents and this is the most marvel indiana jones movie that could possibly exist because it's all about like this fun adventure full of cgi action and like cool quips being spoken by all of the characters and stuff and it's like fun it's it's pretty good i enjoyed it it's way too long it's like two and a half hours long or something and i'm not a huge indiana jones fan so i didn't have like all this baggage or anything i didn't have huge expectations i just had fun with it and then i watched no one will save you which is a movie about a girl alone in her house as she tries to evade invading aliens and the interesting thing about this movie is the huge lack of dialogue almost no words are spoken i think some are very minimally but for the most part nobody's talking and it's mostly just about this woman who is by herself as well so it's really interesting when you consider the fact that the movie does a great job with characterization we learn a lot about this protagonist and what she's been through and what what's happening and everything without anybody explaining it to us there's no exposition it's really impressive in that way but it's also a bit hard to sit through for that reason without people talking it's a bit dull i hate to say but overall it is a pretty damn good movie but the alien design is really well done as well i appreciate that they do look like sort of generic little gray men like you might think about when you think of aliens but then they have like these weird extended limbs that come out in different ways than you might be expecting and it's sort of interesting for that reason too then i watched a movie called quiz lady which is all right then i watched together together which is an ed helms comedy about a man who wants to have a child by himself so he finds a surrogate mother and basically it's about the platonic relationship that him and the mother have while she is pregnant and yeah it's okay it's like nothing too crazy good or anything but if it sounds interesting to you it's probably worth a watch then i watched late night which is a movie about a late night talk show not as good as late night with the devil but still it's okay uh, it has some important things to say about feminism as this is about female writers in a late night talk show then i watched black adam which i did not enjoy this movie is just like so nothing nothing i have no opinion on it it's just it was on and i was there there and i turned it off when it ended and i'm like i'm never gonna think about that again <laughs> that's black adam for you then i watched good morning vietnam which i thought was pretty good but i didn't understand i think any one of the jokes that robin williams said on his radio show in this movie like all the soldiers and other characters and stuff are laughing along <laughs> and i'm like i have no idea what's going on <laughs> like because they're all like outdated impressions mostly and i'm like i don't even know who you're making fun of right now i just i don't get it but it's still a pretty good movie despite that then i watched the equalizer 3 which is basically about denzel washington drinking tea <laughs> and sometimes he kills people and it was like okay i think it was the weakest of the equalizer trilogy but you know it's fine then i went on a bit of a denzel washington binge so next up i watched fences which i'd never seen before and look everybody back in 2016 was absolutely correct this is a phenomenal movie i absolutely love it and i've been wanting to watch it for many a year okay but i remember back in 2016 i could never find a set time i don't think it was showing anywhere and then it was never streaming anywhere so you literally could not watch it here in australia legally and so i never did until now and i guess it was worth the wait because i think that this movie is great that rhyme then i watched roman j israel esquire another denzel washington movie with a terrible title who's gonna remember that title dude now the reason i wanted to watch this movie was 
because it's directed by Dan Gilroy, the director of my favorite movie of all time, Nightcrawler. And that being said, it's baffling that the same dude made this movie and Nightcrawler and also Velvet Buzzsaw, which is terrible. Look, this movie is okay, but I just, how is that coming from the same place as Nightcrawler? It is not nearly as good as Nightcrawler. There are some similarities with Nightcrawler in that the protagonist does some morally questionable things, I suppose, but I don't know, it's just not that interesting. This movie is about a lawyer, that's the premise, I guess. Then I watched Matchstick Men, which is another Nicolas Cage movie from 2003, which is like, okay, it's like a con man movie, but it has an incredible ending and the ending really makes it for me. Then I watched Christine from 2016. This is not the Stephen King haunted car movie. This is a movie about a true story about a real life news reporter who committed suicide live on the air. And basically it's a commentary on the audience, I think. Basically it's a very exploitative film in a way of this news reporter because the reason that we're interested in the story and the reason I wanted to watch this movie is because she killed herself and it kind of turns a woman's real life suicide into a spectacle and it's kind of wrong for that right it's like that's the big exciting part that, that we're all waiting for in a way like we're dreading it we're not like excited in like a positive way or anything but it's undeniably the thing that we're waiting for like as we watch her go along in the lead up to her committing suicide it's really horrible in that way but it's a very interesting film because what does it say about us why are we watching it why are we interested in this story is it because she deserves to have her story told and it's really more respectful or is it more yeah exploiting her and her story profiting off of a suicide like this i don't know there's there's a lot to say here about the media and why we watch what we do it's effective art in that way. I don't know if I enjoyed the movie as much as I admired it. Then I watched like the complete opposite of a movie next. I watched Blue Beetle. This is probably slightly better than Black Adam, I guess, but it's still not great. Then I watched Happiness for Beginners, which is like a movie about people going hiking and camping that was fine. Then I watched Mortal Kombat Legends Cage Match, which is an animated Mortal Kombat film. It's the fourth in the series. I think it's the weakest one yet. This is about Johnny Cage and it's, yeah, it's not that great if I'm being honest. Then I watched a movie called Headcount, which is this indie action movie about this guy who is basically about to be shot in the head as he recollects what has happened with this gun in the like days prior to this very moment as he sort of counts down the bullets that may be in the chamber. So he goes back and he thinks, well, the gun was shot at this point and then it got added, like another bullet got added to it at this point and then two shots happen at this point as he tries to figure out how many bullets are in this gun and if he is about to be killed. It's definitely a very interesting interesting premise and it's one to appreciate because it's definitely a very low budget film and it's impressive despite that. I really enjoy it. Then I watched a movie called The Passenger and I wish that I watched this in time last year for my top 10 list because this is the best 2023 movie as far as I'm concerned. This is my favorite movie of that year now uh, by far like easily easily. I like this more now than Talk To Me and Evil Dead Rise and whatever whatever else came out last year that I loved. The Passenger is like a fantastic version of He Went That Way basically as it's about a psychopath and a mild-mannered guy who go on a road trip together and the guy who is like sort of boring is pretty much being taken hostage by the psychopath but the psychopath is trying to help this other character and they kind of bond they kind of become friends but it's also very tension fueled because this is a thriller and you don't know what the psychopath character is gonna do next it's very compelling I will say. And yeah, it's easily, easily, easily my favorite movie of the of last year. Then I watched Cobweb, which is that horror movie with Homelander in it. And it was, it was pretty good. Then I watched Don't Tell a Soul, which is about Rain Wilson, Dwight from The Office, who falls into a hole and some kids witness him fall into the hole, but they don't know if they should help him out of the hole that he fell in. Because right before he fell in the hole, he witnessed them doing a crime. Then he fell in the hole and then they kind of deal with the dude being in the hole. Now, that being said, with the premise, you have no idea where this movie is going. I promise you. And it's very entertaining. I, I enjoy this movie, but it is a bit silly, I admit. Then I watched Free Fire, which is a movie from 2016 with another great cast. Brie Larson is also in it. And Cillian Murphy, Oppenheimer Boy himself, and a bunch of other people. That being said, I didn't think this movie was that great, to be honest. Then I watched Mr. Harrigan's Phone, which is a Netflix kind of horror movie, but it's really just a coming of age drama. More than anything, that was okay. 
today. Then I watched all of the Wes Anderson shorts that came out last year, including Poison, The Swag, The Ratcatcher, and The Wonderful Story of Henry Sugar. And they're all like pretty good, I guess. They're not really up my alley. I don't really like Wes Anderson all that much. It's like, dude, I get it. You shoot things symmetrically. I know, I know. He's, he's more successful than I'll ever be. He knows more about film than I'll ever know. I get it. That's fine. I'm still allowed to criticize him, <laughs> okay? I don't know. I just, I get it. All of his movies are quirky, but they're all quirky in exactly the same way. It's like, you're not reinventing yourself. You're just doing the same shit over and over and over again. And despite me thinking that the shorts were okay, it definitely had that same Wes Anderson feel that every single one of his movies has. And it's just kind of annoying to me. Then I watched Flashback, another Netflix short film, and it was okay. Then I watched a movie called Ghost Stories, which I thought looked like it could have been really cool. It's like this sort of anthology paranormal investigator thing, which honestly doesn't normally sound that interesting to me, but I don't know. There was something alluring about it. I, I was interested. And I regretted it because this movie kind of sucked. <laughs> then I watched Alan Partridge Alpha Papa. And Alan Partridge, I guess, is like a TV show or something from like, I don't know, the 90s or early 2000s or something. It's got Steve Coogan in it as this character, Alan Partridge. I don't know. I've never seen this show or anything, but I watched this movie and it's about his character who's basically being taken hostage at his like radio show place, the radio studio, whatever it's called. And that being said, it's kind of funny and entertaining. Then I watched Pete Davidson again, another stand up special called SM. MD, and I pretty much feel the same way about this one. It's kind of shitty, but the dude's so likable that he somehow transcends. Uh, then I watched Jerry Seinfeld, I'm telling you for the last time. And look, I like Seinfeld. I like the show Seinfeld quite a lot, but his stand-up is very outdated at this point. This felt very, it felt like a boomer stand-up special. I don't know. I didn't super connect with it. Then I watched Unwelcome, which is a movie about like evil little trolls or goblins or something. Little creatures, it's like a horror comedy that was fun. Then I watched Tetris the Taron Edgerton movie about not the man that makes Tetris, but the man that distributes Tetris to the US, which I just think is kind of a baffling approach. Is it not more interesting to take a look at the dude that invented Tetris? And the guy that invented Tetris is in this movie, but he's not the protagonist. And it's like, why is the movie about this? It's, it's strange, <laughs> but it was okay for what it was. Then I watched Killers of the Flower Moon, and I have some controversial things to say here. First up, Take this into context, okay? I'm not a fan of Martin Scorsese. I don't really like his movies all that much. Sure, I like Goodfellas and Shutter Island and I don't know, a bunch of others, but overall, I, d I just, I don't really like his movies that much. I don't emotionally connect to them, you know? Like, I can't say a bad thing about him. I can't be like, well, dude doesn't know how to make movies. Clearly he does. He's a master at his craft, okay? I, I understand that, I respect it, but I don't really enjoy watching his movies very much. And with Killers of the Flower Moon, I hate Hated it. I do not understand the love for this movie at all. For one, I don't know why Lily Gladstone's character isn't the protagonist. It's really her story. I don't know why Leonardo DiCaprio is the main character of this story. I don't understand that choice. It's very strange to me in my opinion. I also don't understand how Lily Gladstone's character didn't know what he was doing. Or maybe she did? I don't know. I don't really understand. See, the thing about this movie is I think I missed a bunch of stuff. I think I didn't understand it. Be Possibly because I don't know the history. I'm not American and maybe I'm missing a bunch of the context. But also because I don't think the movie did a great job at explaining its story. For example, there's a part in this movie where some children die and we're supposed to be very sad. And it's like, yes, on a base level, children deaths is quite sad. Sure, you, you can sympathize in that way, right? But on a personal level, the movie never showed us these kids as characters. I didn't give a shit personally. I was like, God damn, those kids died. That's horrible. But I wasn't like, oh, God damn, little Johnny and Mary or whatever the fuck their names were died. You know what I mean? Like, it just felt like this movie really glazed over a lot of the details. Didn't make me emotionally invested. And that being said, it's like a three hour movie. It's so long, but it still doesn't explain vital information in my opinion. But maybe I'm just a dumb person who missed a bunch of stuff. I'm very open to that idea. And it's probably true to some extent, I'll admit, because I wasn't super into it. Maybe it lost my interest and I missed some stuff. I'm willing to admit that possibility for sure. But overall, I would still say that I don't think that this movie is the masterpiece that everybody's making it out to be. And look, I do think that it has an interesting premise. I think the story behind it is very interesting as basically the rich Native Americans are being taken advantage of the white people. It's the same sort of thing that we know from history, but it's sort of a subversion because in this case, the Native Americans are sort of the ones who should have power, but still 
still somehow don't because they're being taken advantage of. It's an interesting premise with that being said, but it's just not well executed in my opinion. I think that this movie would have been better in the hands of maybe Quentin Tarantino or the Coen brothers. I don't know if that's a controversial take. I don't know if anybody agrees with me, but I just think Marty, Marty sucks, okay? And I just feel like everybody should get off Martin Scorsese's dick, dude. Then I watched The Trip, another Steve Coogan movie. And this is about him basically playing himself as he goes on a road trip with his friend and they try to make jokes with each other. And they do a bunch of impressions. And I'm just like, this is kind of boring. <laughs> then I watched John Mulaney, New in Town. This is his first stand-up special that he did that I find anyway. Um, and yeah, he was good from the start. Who would have thought? Then I watched A Jedi's Return, the Kenobi documentary about the making of the TV show on Disney Plus, which was okay, pretty much exactly the same as those Marvel Assembled documentaries, which speaking of, I then watched Assembled, Guardians 3 documentary, Assembled, One Division documentary, Assembled, Ant-Man 3, Quantumania documentary, Assembled, Thor 4, Love and Thunder documentary, Assembled, Doctor Strange 2, Multiverse of Madness documentary. I watched them all and they're all pretty good, I guess. Then I watched The After, a Netflix short about a man dealing with grief following the death of his wife and daughter. And this is a short that is trying to be tragic but it feels like it's coming from a very disingenuous place to me. Just didn't hit me right. Maybe it was the day. Maybe if I rewatched it again, I'd think differently. But there was something about it that felt like it was trying too hard to pull at your heartstrings in a way that ended up just making it feel kind of silly, if I'm being honest. Maybe that's a horrible thing to say. I get that people deal with grief in their own different personal ways, but there was just something about this movie that I didn't think was that well done. Then I watched SLC Punk, an early Matthew Lillard movie, although not that early because this is after Scream. And basically it's about the subculture of like punk rock it's about these punk kids who like you know say fuck the establishment fuck the man that's their whole attitude it's their entire identity and it's sort of interesting learning a little bit about that punk culture because i'm sort of adjacent to it i'm not a punk person or anything but i like pop punk and i like emo music and stuff so i'm sort of like two steps over from being you know punk I guess like not personally but at least the music but yeah it's a good movie and I like watching this be basically like it's a coming of age movie as you watch these guys mature and learn that maybe there's more to life than being punk then I watched Theo Von Regular People and Theo Von No Offense these are stand-up comedy specials from this comedian called Theo Von who would have guessed um and there's something about this comedian this guy that baffles me but I kind of appreciate it there's something about him where it's like you never know where he's coming from like you don't know if the absurdity of the things that he's saying is coming from a place of self-awareness or if the dude's just an idiot because he seems dumb he seems like a stupid person i don't want to be mean but he does he seems dumb but i think that maybe that's on purpose and that's the genius of his comedy i think he's playing a character and i think he's a lot smarter than he gives the impression of but maybe that's not true and maybe he's just an idiot who got lucky i don't know he's an enigma this guy and i find it like infinitely fascinating that being said these stand-up specials probably weren't that good i don't think he was as funny in them as he is in his podcast because sometimes I see his podcast clips and YouTube shorts and stuff and yeah I don't know there's just something interesting about this guy I wanted to learn where he's coming from with this stand-up special and so I did that and yeah they were okay then I watched Pete Holmes I'm not for everyone another stand-up comedy special and I didn't really like this one no I did it was okay it's just that he comes from a very religious -y sort of place and I didn't super connect with that aspect of this. But then I watched Mike Birbiglia, The Old Man in the Pool. Mike Birbiglia, the new one. Mike Birbiglia, thank God for jokes. Mike Birbiglia, my girlfriend's boyfriend. And Mike Birbiglia, what I should have said was nothing. This Mike Birbiglia guy who I only discovered like just this year is my favorite comedian of all time now, I think. Because he mixes tragedy with his comedy. And he comes from a very human place. Where he really talks about real life experiences. And dude, there's something about this guy's writing that is absolutely heartbreaking and heartwarming and hilarious and so funny. He gets emotional. He, he does these really, really ingenious callbacks. His writing is very like cyclical. It'll come back to things that he was talking about before as he describes his life experiences with illnesses that he's dealt with and observations on all these sorts of things. He gets emotional, but is also very, very funny. And basically, these are not really stand-up comedy specials. He calls them one-man acts. And there's a reason for that. Really, this guy's a storyteller.
storyteller who happens to also be really really funny and there's something that I really appreciate about just how much emotion he can pack in to these simple stories about his life it's all just anecdotal stories about his life but there's something about them that's just really captivating he's a fantastic storyteller he talks about how he loves his wife and his daughter and stuff and it's really nice in that way and then he'll complain about like the absurdities of life in really funny ways there's something magical about these shows man I recommend watching all of them they're all like five star shows except for maybe the earliest one called what I should have said was nothing that one was slightly weaker if only because it was a bit outdated and he probably didn't master his craft just yet but they just get better and better with the most recent one the old man in the pool probably being his best yet then I watched a movie called retribution with my dad which is a Liam Neeson movie about Liam Neeson discovering that there is a bomb in his car and he gets called by the guy that put the bomb in his car and he gets instructed by the guy that put the bomb in his car to stay in the car and to drive around and do things that he says or else the bomb's gonna explode his car and and it's like a thriller and it's it's okay it's it's not that good to be honest then i watched alice darling which is a movie about an abusive relationship and it's very interesting uh it's a very frustrating watch as well though as you watch the main character sort of obviously sort of give the power to her partner in a way that is detrimental to her but you can also see why she keeps continuously falling into these traps basically as he gaslights her and yeah verbally mostly abuses her and it's it's really sad to watch as it plays out and mostly though this movie is about the sort of weekend she's away from him as we can still see though the power that he has over her even when he's not there she feels bad all the time she feels scared and worried about like I don't know doing the wrong thing without him there and all that sort of stuff and it feels just really yeah really sad Anna Kendrick plays the main character in this and I thought that she did like a really fantastic job um you can really see sort of the trauma in her character this is maybe probably her best role. Then I watched Dick Johnson is Dead which is a documentary about a man who is reaching the end of his life and the documentarian who happens to be his daughter who wants to present that and it's really not as good as it sounds. I thought that this was gonna be really up my alley and it ended up being sort of dull and I think that that came in the editing because it sort of kept like making us watch him interact with his grandkids and like just I don't know, cross the street <laughs> or something like that. Like he's doing very mundane things. And I guess that's the point because it's like real life. But there was something about it that just like wasn't focusing on the most interesting aspects I felt like. And I think that was a deliberate choice, but it just, it wouldn't have been the choice I would have wanted, I guess. I thought it was going to be funnier than that. I don't know. Maybe it's because of the poster. Next up, I watched The Royal Hotel, which is about two American girls who show up in the outback to get a job as they're like traveling and they work at a bar in the outback. And basically it's about how creepy old men in the outback can be and the things that women have to deal with. And it's very much a slow slow burn thriller movie where not that much really happens and so it's not the most interesting then I watched OG which is another Jeffrey Wright movie about a man who has been in prison for like 20 30 years or something and just basically how that's affected him for you know his entire life he's grown accustomed to this he belongs there at this point really it feels like home to him it's basically like that one plot line in the Shawshank Redemption where the guy kills himself after being released from prison but for the entire movie then I watched a movie called Cat Person, which I absolutely love. This is definitely one of my favorite movies that I've watched this year. It's about a man and a woman who enter a relationship and initially they connect over their love of cats. He talks about his cats and, you know, the, their behavior and stuff. And so she kind of falls for him in that way. But when she eventually finds herself over at his apartment or his house one day, uh, she sees that there are no cats around. And it's like, what's up with that? You know, what are this guy's intentions? It's a bit suspicious. You don't know where he's coming from. And basically it ends up kind of being like a thriller version of 500 days of summer as it's like a he said she said argument and you can see different perspectives you understand where both characters are coming from in the end and it's really really interesting for that reason i highly recommend it then i watched bean movie the bean movie the mr bean movie uh, i was over at my friend's house him and his girlfriend wanted to watch the mr bean movie not the one where he goes on holiday it's just called bean he goes to la in this one because they think he's like this artist guy or something for some reason they think he's like this expert art seller or consultant or something but they ship him over to LA and 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 hijinks ensue and I was so 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 reluctant to watch this movie I was not interested my friend was like let's watch the bean movie and I'm like 
let's not <laughs> can, can we please not actually but come on go let, let, pick something else please please pick something else but then he put it on and there's this one scene where mr bean is like in the toilet and he's washing his hands after you know doing his biz um and then he gets water all over the front of his pants and it looks like he pissed himself and what follows <laughs> is a series of him trying to hide the his crotch from everybody in a business meeting <laughs> It's so fucking stupid. Why do I like it? I loved it. I loved it. I loved this movie. Once that scene happened, it, it completely took me over and I'm like, yes, let's enjoy this fucking stupid movie. Mr. Bean. It's fantastic. It's phenomenal. I highly recommend it if you haven't seen it. Okay. Next up, I watched a movie called Two Leslie, which is about a woman who basically she won the lottery and then pissed it all away prior to the events of this movie. And it's about her trying to rebuild her life back up from that, I guess. Um, and that being said, we never really see her with the money after having won the lottery. And I think that's the interesting part of the story. And they chose to do the the boring part of the story, which is weird to me, but yeah, it wasn't too bad, but it wasn't that good either. Then I watched Those Who Wish Me Dead, which has Angelina Jolie in it and John Bernthal, who is not in it enough. I fucking love John Bernthal. Anyway, this is like a mid-budget thriller movie. It wasn't phenomenal or anything, but it's just like a good solid movie that I felt in the mood for when I watched it. Hit the right spot and that's about as simple as that. Then I watched Dazed and Confused. I've been wanting to watch this for so many years and I was highly uninterested while watching. <laughs> This is a movie about kids in high school and it's the last day of high school and that's that's as far as the premise goes. It's just a hangout movie, nothing happens, and I can finally see what Licorice Pizza was trying to be. But I also hated Licorice Pizza. So I, yeah, I was not into this movie. All right, all right, all right. Then I watched Super Intelligence, which is a Melissa McCarthy comedy about a AI robot alien thing um, who is trying to study humanity via studying and spending time with the most average woman on earth or so the premise says which i think is kind of hilarious because her husband directed this movie melissa mccarthy's husband ben falcone he directed it so it basically feels like he's calling his wife the most average woman on earth it's kind of hurtful dude <laughs> i don't know i just thought that was funny anyway uh this movie kind of sucks but once it turns into a bit of a rom-com because it sort of is it starts getting kind of good and i kind of enjoyed it i don't know <laughs> it's okay then i watched the hunter which is a willem dafoe movie about him coming to Australia to hunt the Tasmanian tiger, the supposedly, I guess, extinct animal. He tells everybody when he comes over that he's actually here to study the Tasmanian devils, but he's really here to hunt the extinct animal. And it's really boring. <laughs> oh my God, this movie's so boring, dude. It's so slow and nothing happens and, and I, I did not have a good time with it. I'm sorry. Sometimes I feel like I just say a movie is boring and I'm like, do I sound like a child? Maybe. Then I watched Dune, speaking of boring. Oh God, oh God. I pissed off all my friends with my opinions on Dune. It's just not a movie for me. That's what I'll say and I'll leave it at that. Then I watched 65, which is that movie about Adam Driver fighting dinosaurs and it's also boring. <laughs> Three boring movies in a row. I am a child with no attention span, aren't I? Then I watched a movie called Spoiler Alert, which stars the, the Sheldon guy, the guy from the Big Bang Theory, the dude who says Bazinga. And I'm really giving you the wrong impression saying that because this is a very sad movie about a gay relationship and it's very moving and tragic and fantastic. It's a cancer movie, so you kind of know where it's going and all that sort of thing. But yeah, it's pretty great. It is pretty great. I, li I like it. Then I watched You Hurt My Feelings, which is another sort of like slow emotional movie but it's also sort of a comedy and this is very much about relationships and marriage and it's all about like white lies as the movie is about a author who finds out that her husband doesn't like the book that she's writing and she's very hurt by this she takes it very personally and we're kind of forced to consider well is the husband just supporting her should he be honest should he just say the right thing say good things you know like what's the right thing to do in that situation doesn't even matter what he thinks and so the movie just sort of explores that idea and yeah I enjoyed it. Then I watched A Good Person starring Florence Pugh and directed by Zach Braff. That's really the reason I wanted to watch this because I'm a huge fan of Scrubs so I wanted to see where he's coming from movie wise. So far the films I've seen of his I do not like. Garden State not great. The Last Kiss Goodbye or some shit not great. Other movies possibly that he made. You Were Never Here or I Wish I Was There or I Wish You Were Not Here or something. <laughs> 
the poster up. Uh, yeah. I don't like Zach Braff's movies, unfortunately, and a good person can be added to that list. I don't think that this movie is particularly very good. It's probably his best one yet, but I think that's more to do with Florence Pugh and Morgan Freeman, more so than his direction. You know, you kind of, you know his approach, right? He's kind of like Wes Anderson. He wants to be quirky. He wants to be a hipster, you know? And so every frame is kind of drenched in like, look how weird I am. And it's like, yeah. I get it. Then I watched Insomnia. I went on kind of a Christopher Nolan binge. I'd never seen Insomnia, so I watched it. This is about Al Pacino trying to catch the killer of Robin Williams in this movie, but along the way, he accidentally kills somebody else and he covers it up. And it's basically about their relationship from there because they sort of bond over the fact that he's keeping this death a secret or how this person died anyway, a secret. And it's very much like a morally gray, interesting movie about this cop who is doing the wrong thing, but who wants to be a good person. He regrets what happened but he's also a fucking douchebag. I hate the Albertino character in this movie. He's like, he's such a dick. <laughs> and I don't know, there was just something about it. It was sort of compelling. I wasn't crazy about it, but it was interesting. And it was interesting seeing an early Christopher Nolan movie like this, which feels like the least Christopher Nolan movie that I've ever seen that was made by Christopher Nolan anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, weird that it came from him, to be honest. Then I watched Following, which is Christopher Nolan's Zarek Terrier debut. Uh, it's the first movie he ever made. I just that's what directorial debut means. I said the same thing twice. Anyway, so this is a movie about a guy who decides to follow people on the streets. Just random people for some reason. Basically stalking them, but they use the word follow. And then it sort of turns into like this crime drama where they begin to steal from people's houses. And with that being said, I don't understand this movie. <laughs> I didn't really get what happened and I don't really understand why the characters are doing what they're doing and I just found it pretty dull but you know it was interesting seeing where Christopher Nolan sort of originated it was interesting watching it I also found it kind of funny how everybody in it is basically like a 20 year old white guy because clearly those were like his friends or whatever and like that's how all filmmakers have to start basically so yeah it's always kind of funny seeing that but yeah I thought this movie was more interesting than it was good you know because of its sources because it's Christopher Nolan back 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 in the day 1998 uh, early early Christopher Nolan but yeah I didn't think it was very good at the same time then I watched Oppenheimer hadn't seen Oppenheimer yet and I don't know, I'm not as crazy about this as everybody else. I think the two first thirds are pretty good, but then that last third, I just say, cut it. Cut it and it's a better movie. I don't care about the court case part. I think that's a pretty common complaint about it. But the reason I don't care about it personally is because I don't understand why Oppenheimer was even on trial. I'm a stupid person. I don't know things about history. I don't understand really what was going on in that last third. I'm embarrassed to say it, but it's true. Anyway, um, it was okay, and it had a f fucking amazing cast. Everybody ever is in this movie. I think I might be in this movie. It's like, seriously, famous upon famous people show up like every two seconds, down to the last hour. Gary Oldman shows up for one scene. <laughs> it's like, there's just, there's people everywhere in this movie. It's incredible. It's crazy. It's so strange. Anyway, then I watched Spies in Disguise, which is that animated Will Smith and Tom Tom Holland movie where Will Smith's character turns into a pigeon. It was okay, but I uh, didn't like it that much. Then I watched Moneyball, which is that Brad Pitt, Jonah Hill movie about baseball. Now, I know nothing about baseball. I don't know how it works. I couldn't tell you one baseball player's name from history, from currently, from anything. I don't know anything about baseball. I know that they can hit home runs. I know there are bases. I know that the Red Sox is a team, I think, and the New York Yankees, they, they are probably baseball teams. And that that is the extent of my baseball knowledge. But that being said, Moneyball's a good movie. <laughs> and so I liked it. Then I watched Philadelphia, a movie from the early 90s, 92, I believe, starring Denzel Washington and Tom Hanks. And it's about a guy who lost his job based loosely on a true story, I believe. And it, yeah, it's about a guy who got fired for being gay, basically. They find out that he has AIDS and they find out that he's gay and they fire him for this reason. And it's about the court case that follows this because he sues them for this reason, thinking it's like a wrongful firing or whatever, and that a law has been broken. And what I really like about this movie is that Denzel Washington's character, who is the lawyer like defending him, is homophobic. They don't 
don't turn him into this wonderful, wonderful accepting guy who just loves everybody and is like, yeah, gay people. No, he's an asshole. He's a homophobic guy who uses the F slur and who like doesn't respect that lifestyle. But yet he still cares about the law and he still cares that something wrong has happened and he wants to defend Tom Hanks's character anyway, despite looking at gay people in a negative light. And I just thought that that was realistic. They didn't turn him into this wonderful, iconic, heroic character. They just turned him into a person who cares about justice. And I feel like that's pretty realistic, I guess, especially for the time. Um, and I thought that was interesting. And yeah, it's a good movie. It's a fantastic movie, actually. Tom Hanks apparently won Best Actor in it for that year, so... Good for him. Then I watched a movie called The Sunset Limited, which is about Tommy Lee Jones and Samuel L. Jackson sitting around in a room and talking for the entirety of it. And they basically just talk about like religion, the meaning of life and philosophy as Tommy Lee Jones plays a cynical atheist who is trying to commit suicide and Samuel L. Jackson who plays an ex-convict who is a deeply faithful man. And so basically it's just about their argument. And it's very funny listening to their conversation and very insightful and interesting. It's not very cinematic though, but I didn't really mind that. You can kind of think of this as like a podcast where they are playing these characters. And maybe if it came out nowadays and not in 2011, it would be a cinematic podcast maybe. I could see that. Anyway, I enjoyed listening to them talk and I thought this was pretty good. But it didn't really go anywhere, I will say. When it sort of ended, I'm like, ah, oh, that's it. So if that sounds interesting to you, I think it's worth a watch. But you may be disappointed come the end. I'm not sure. Then I watched Porn Sacrifice, which is about Bobby Fisher, the famous chess player played by Tobey Maguire. And yeah, that's pretty much the reason I wanted to watch this because of Tobey Maguire. I didn't know much about Bobby Fischer aside from he could do stuff like he could, he could see things from four moves ahead or whatever and he was really good and smart and stuff. But I found this movie really interesting because he was also dealing with a lot of mental issues basically. He was sort of going crazy I think due to the publicity that had dawned on him um, in his life at this point where everybody was kind of watching him and knew who he was and it kind of made him paranoid so much so that he thought the Russians and stuff were out to get him he thought that people were like looking at him through cameras and who had wired his phone and he was just worried about people watching him and knowing his private business and all these sorts of things that like every single situation in his life and it's kind of like a sad thing watching him deal with these things but he's also kind of an asshole he's not a very likable guy and I don't know it's a bit like in Philadelphia with Denzel Washington's character I appreciate when a movie isn't afraid to make their leading character unlikable I I appreciate that. I think it's ballsy and I thought this movie was pretty good. Then I watched Francis Ha because I was interested in seeing Greta Gerwig in a movie after Barbie and Lady Bird and stuff. I don't think I'd seen her in a movie or if I had, I forgot. But yeah, I watched Francis Ha and it was okay. I wasn't crazy about it, but you know, half some time. Then I watched the Underworld movies for the first time. I pretty much only like Underworld 1 and 4. I know that's so specific, but 1 and 4 to me are just fun, dumb action movies that embraces that. But the other movies, especially 3, which is a prequel, are all about the explanations of like the lore behind the underworld universe. It explains why the lichens or werewolves or whatever and the vampires are fighting and, and all this sort of stuff and I'm sitting there like, I don't care. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I'm not taking this that seriously, underworld. Do you understand that? I don't actually care why they're fighting. I don't care about what's going on in the wider universe. I just want to see Kate Beckinsale kill some fucking dudes because it's fun <laughs> you know what i mean i don't know so yeah i liked one and four quite a lot the others were all pretty middling to me and i hated three anyway next up i watched no time to die because i don't know i hadn't seen it wanted to see it i'm not really a james bond fan in particular but you know it was the last daniel craig one it's kind of historic for that reason i suppose i wanted to watch it and yeah it was okay anna de armes barely in this movie i'm probably the last one to have found that out but just letting you know i was surprised she's in like only a few scenes i thought she was gonna be like the second in charge kind of role you know i thought if anything she was probably gonna take over the james bond role next or something and that's what they were like setting up but no apparently not aaron taylor johnson's gonna be james bond apparently next up i watched american splendor which is a movie with paul giamatti in it and it's about a real life comic strip writer not artist he couldn't draw for shit apparently um and i thought this movie was super boring and i didn't really like it then i watched evan almighty and fuck me do i hate evan almighty this movie is so fucking 
terrible in every way. This is a sequel to the 2003 comedy Bruce Almighty starring Jim Carrey. But Evan Almighty, instead of just him getting God's powers, instead he becomes Noah, like from Noah's Ark. And animals begin surrounding him and he has to make an ark for an incoming flood. And it's really dumb and I hate it. Basically this movie is just about various animals running into Steve Carell's balls over and over again. And he goes, ah, we're supposed to laugh because it's so funny. That's the level of comedy that we're dealing with here. It's so shit, dude. But they somehow tricked like so many actors in being in this movie. Morgan Freeman came back to play God. Obviously Steve Carell was in this though. This was early-ish in his career, so I guess it makes sense. Jonah Hill is in this in an early role. John Goodman is in it too. What the fuck? John Goodman, what are you doing in this piece of shit? And also, Hank Schrader from Breaking Bad, he shows up for one scene where he plays like a background cop who is reacting to the incoming flood. Ah, I thought that was kind of funny. Next up, I watched Saving Mr. Banks, which is about the making, basically, of Mary Poppins. And it's about the true life thing that happened with Disney and the author of Mary Poppins. And much like the assembled things I was talking about before, I think this movie definitely sugarcoated the real events, where it's basically about uh, Walt Disney fucking over the author of Mary Poppins and turning it into the movie that he wants and that she doesn't. It's kind of an interesting watch though that being said I've never seen Mary Poppins so maybe I missed a bunch. Maybe this wasn't exactly for me but I still enjoyed it. Then I watched The Outlaws which is an Adam Devine comedy movie not Adam Levine that's the Maroon 5 guy. Adam Devine and it's basically about him finding out that his in-laws are outlaws. They're bank robbers. Oh no. And he finds himself in, in, in disastrous results because of this. Oh no. It's like a crime comedy and it's kind of shitty if I'm being honest. Then I watched Hellboy from 2019 the David Harbour Hellboy and it was kind of fun I guess I wasn't like you know blown away by it but like I had fun with it I suppose then I watched Milk this is a movie about the first man in like office in like government office who was openly gay and basically yeah it's all about him trying to get um elected I forgot the word elected for a second there. Uh, yeah, and it's definitely very interesting, like, watching these, the, the progress take place. Like, some of these gay guys in this movie are, like, fucking punk rock, like, fighting cops and stuff because they're not accepted and they just want rights. And, yeah, it made me appreciate, uh, the movement that had to take place back then. And it's kind of annoying, too, because, like, um, uh, the, the main character in Harvey Milk, who was a real-life person, like, you can see him having to deal with trivial bullshit that we know he's better than like he could literally just live his life as a happy person and stuff if he didn't have to deal with all this straight people's homophobic people's bullshit basically um but but still he has to fight for his people you know he has to fight for himself i liked it quite a bit now we're up to my rewatches. so first up i watched crazy stupid love love that movie and then i watched tick tick boom love that movie then i watched spider-man no way home love that movie if you can believe it then i watched middle ditch and schwartz which is a improv comedy Netflix special with three episodes and I watched this twice this year they were both rewatches because it's so fucking funny I highly recommend it then I rewatched all the Star Wars movies in preparation for a ranking video I did if you want to know all my opinions on the Star Wars movies check that video out I also rewatched the founder basically the kind of founder of McDonald's the fast food restaurant but not really it's basically about how Ray Kroc fucked the McDonald's over he basically stole the restaurant from them and turned it into this conglomerate that it was never really intended to be. It's a very interesting watch about a villainous character who is the main character. Then I rewatched Pirates of the Caribbean 1 and 2 but I kind of stopped there. I didn't watch any of the others because I got kind of sick of them. Then I rewatched Venom and Venom 2 Let Them Be Carnage and these movies are so funny dude. Like somehow I, I think I kind of missed it the first time around that these movies are more comedies than they even are action movies. It's phenomenal. Tom Hardy is so good in them. Then I watched Get Out and look people say that there's no such thing as a perfect film but the dude that said that ain't seen Get Out because that is absolute perfection. Speaking of absolute perfection 500 Days of Summer one of my all time favourite movies and by far. Then I watched The Fundamentals of Caring which is about Paul Rudd looking after a physically disabled kid and it's really uplifting though. It's good. It's good. Then I watched Me and Earl and the Dying Girl which is the same sort of quirky comedy thing as the previous two films. Then I watched Luck speaking of Tom Hardy 
party just before. This is a movie about him driving in a car, talking to people on the phone, and it's riveting for every fucking second of it. Love, love. Then I watched Three Billboards, which is another absolutely perfect movie. I fucking love Three Billboards. More than life itself, that's not true, but still. Then I watched The Voices, a horror comedy starring Ryan Reynolds about him killing people. I think that it is fantastic. Then I watched Wolf Creek, the iconic Australian horror movie, the one that everybody knows. And look, I like this movie a lot. I think it earns its status of being iconic, but I do have issues with it. Like for instance, I don't love that the characters, and this is gonna sound bad, but the characters don't go through that much. Like by the time they actually realize that something's going on, they're killed pretty quickly. I would have preferred if they found out earlier and most of the movie was about the thrill of the chase, sort of more like The Strangers or some other movie like that. But instead we spend like the first entire half leading up to anything happening and then by by the time we get to the end, some of the characters hardly faced any thing really and I feel like that's a bad thing to say because if I woke up in this killer's sort of dungeon thing with my arms uh, barbed wired up and stuck and I had to pull that out and escape I'd be petrified for life sure I'd have trauma but in terms of in comparison to many other movies because this is a movie it feels not as high stakes as I would love but it's going for gritty and realistic so I'm complaining about fucking nothing and bullshit so shut up don't listen to me then I watched Man Up a Simon Pegg rom-com that I like quite a bit. Then I watched Adventureland, the Jesse Eisenberg, Kristen Stewart, Ryan Reynolds, and Bill Hader comedy movie. Bill Hader plays like, he's not in it much, but he plays this really funny character that I like. But as for the movie overall, it's kind of shit. This is like the sixth or seventh time I've watched it too. And I always think, nah, I'm gonna like it more than I did last time. I just wasn't like mature enough to appreciate it before. And I always think, yeah, I'm gonna rewatch it and I'm gonna like it. And then I just never do. This movie sucks. I don't, I don't like it very much. Maybe you have to be nostalgic for the era that it's set in, which I'm not. I wasn't alive for it. Maybe that's what I'm missing. I'm not sure. I feel like I am missing something, but I just can't quite put my finger on it, you know? Anyway, then I watched Warm Bodies, which is the sort of rom-com zombie movie with Nicholas Holt and Teresa Palmer. And it's kind of weird because she's like falling in love with a zombie. And it's kind of like, ew. <laughs> nah, but it's pretty good. I like this movie. Then I watched Psycho Gorman. This was the same day that I watched the Mr. Bean movie because I then made my friend watch Psycho Gorman. And <laughs> following it, they both said that they had never seen a movie like it, and I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> then I watched The Big Sick, which is great. Then I watched Celeste and Jesse Forever, a very sad movie uh, with Andy Samberg. It's like more of a drama than it is a comedy, and I like it. Then I watched A Case of You, a Justin Long rom-com, which is good-ish, it's okay. Then I watched A Street Cat Named Bob, one of my all-time favorites as well. Then I rewatched Whiplash, which is a movie that I've always liked, but I don't think I loved as much as everybody else and I think upon this rewatch which was like my third or fourth time yeah I get it <laughs> I get it I do I this was the time I've liked this movie most when I've watched it and man I liked it a lot the thing about this movie that I find really interesting is like is the abuse worth it and I think that the movie is actually saying that it is I think it justifies uh Fletcher's actions I think it shows that he as a teacher is getting that motivation out of his students that he that he's intending to through Miles Teller's character right like like he becomes the great musician because of that. And I think that that's fucked up. I think that that's kind of wrong. I know if I was in that place, I would not find it motivating being literally physically and verbally abused. Uh, like he throws chairs at people and shit. So it is physical as well. I wouldn't appreciate that. And I would cry and I would quit. But maybe that says about me that I'm a quitter and a loser and I don't have the right to be a great musician or some shit. I don't have what it takes. And I don't, cause I'm not that musically inclined, but um, <laughs> not for that reason, you know? like. I I, I, I couldn't take this abuse. And it's interesting watching this movie being like, well, is that how you pass through to the greats? You know, and, it, and my answer is no. <laughs> I guess. But I think the movie is saying yes. Uh, I don't know. And I, I do find that interesting. But I still hate. I I hate that approach. You know? Like I think J.K. Simmons comes off as like such a bad person. And I hate him in this movie. But he's captivating to watch. Uh, then I watched Marriage Story. Uh, which is great. 
Then I rewatched No Country for Old Men. Then I rewatched Seven. And controversially, this is the first time that I've ever actually completed watching Seven. Every other time I've watched Seven, I kind of dipped out like halfway through because I found the whole thing to be pretty boring. And I knew the ending, so I knew where it was going anyway. And so I just always thought, yeah, who cares? This time I watched all the way through, I paid much more attention to it. And I fucking love Seven, dude. <laughs> what the fuck was wrong with me? <laughs> Seven is amazing. I love the ending. The ending fucking makes the movie, man. And I did not know all the context for it. I knew what was in the box. That's all I knew. And sure, that's a big thing to know, but I didn't know all the context surrounding it. And man, John Doe is a fantastic villain, even though he's unfortunately played by Kevin Spacey. Damn it. But um, yeah, I think this is a phenomenal film. Uh, David Fincher, you know, who knew he could make good movies, right? Uh, then I rewatched Inception and The Prestige. This was during my Christopher Nolan watches when I watched Insomnia and Oppenheimer and stuff. I watched all these at about the same time. Then I rewatched Birds of Prey, which is really fun. Then I rewatched Arrival, which is a perfect movie as well, along with Get Out and whatever else I said was a perfect movie before. And then I rewatched re Buried, the Ryan Reynolds movie where he is buried in a grave under ground talking to people on the phone desperately trying to be rescued it's a riveting watch despite just being placed in this one setting and being a pretty you know a slow burn of a film then i rewatched the shawshank redemption and yeah man i don't know like it's not controversial to say that that's a fucking banger of a movie okay it's good i don't think i love it as much as other people do i don't think it warrants being number one on imdb for ever it's not the best movie of all time like some people seem to think it is but it is a hell of a solid movie then i rewatched a bunch of of Quentin Tarantino movies not all of them but a bunch of them I watched The Hateful Eight which I liked the most this this rewatch uh, then I watched Django Unchained which I think is my favorite Quentin Tarantino movie I think Inglorious Bastards is his best but Django is my favorite then I rewatched Reservoir Dogs which is clearly his earliest work you know there's there's flaws to it for sure but it's definitely an impressive directorial debut then I also rewatched Pulp Fiction and I actually think I disliked this the most out of any times I've watched it. I still think it's great. I still love it. I still think it's a, like a four and a half out of five type of movie for me. But I don't know. I just like, I know that I love this movie, but this most recent rewatch, I just, I was like, hmm, I don't like this as much as I usually do. <laughs> Maybe it was just a bad day. I don't know. But I also wish that the entire movie was about Vincent and Jules. I just, I just wish the whole thing was about them. Then I also watched Bad Times at the El Royale. The best Quentin Tarantino movie, not directed by Quentin Tarantino, but Drew Gooden, who also made not Drew Gooden, that's a YouTube. Drew Goddard. <laughs> Directed by Drew Goddard, who also made Cabin in the Woods. I love this movie. Okay, now we're up to TV shows. First up, I watched Shrinking, which is a Bill Lawrence show, the guy who created Scrubs and Cougar Town and Ted Lasso. And it's pretty much as good as all those shows. Then I also watched The Bear for the first time, which is great. I don't know if it's as good as everybody says it is, but it is great. Then I watched the Obi-Wan Kenobi show, which was okay. Then I watched Icons Unearthed, The Simpsons, a six-part documentary on basically the startup of the Simpsons as a TV show how it all sort of got made which was interesting but I did know a lot of it already and it did feel a bit repetitive as well uh, then I watched the latest season of Ted Lasso the last and then I watched The Walking Dead The Ones Who Live but I've only watched two and a half episodes because look I loved the first episode. I'm like, yes, Rick Grimes is back. This is so my shit. And then I watched episode two and it started to introduce all these characters I didn't care about. And it was clearly about this like evil faction once again, because of course it fucking is. It's just like episodes two and three, which I dipped out on halfway through, proved to me that this is just the same shit that The Walking Dead has been doing for a decade. I just don't give a fuck. I just, I just can't do it again. I can't keep doing it, you know? I'm not letting it get me again. I watched every season of The Walking Dead and I regret that it was not worth it oh god I love Rick Grimes but I just I just can't deal with watching another fucking season of oh no there's new bad guys now we've defeated the new bad guys let's go survive and then oh no there's new new bad guys and that's all that it fucking is once again there's a new evil faction and it's just like fuck you I'm just I'm just so fucking done with this formula I was fucking done with it in season four <laughs> just briefly I'll also go through the video games I've been playing I played through all of all that four Fallout 3 and some of New Vegas. I stopped halfway through though because I discovered a little game called Vampire Survivors and it has become the meaning of my life. Vampire Survivors is the most addictive, fun video game that's ever been made. One dude made it and it's 
It's perfection. It's the best. You see the numbers go up. You level up. You collect the blue gems all the time. You kill thousands upon thousands and tens of thousands of enemies. It's the most simplistic 2D stupid just horde survivor game. And, but, but, but there's something about it that I just fucking love. I fucking love it so much. Vampire Survivors is the best. Anyway. It's 1am and I'm going to stop talking about Vampire Survivors now. Um, I'm sick of talking. <laughs> Hopefully you enjoyed this video. Sorry it went for so long. Uh, but that, yeah, 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 yeah. That's everything that I watched for this first quarter of 2024. <sighs> Before you go, please do, do the, the things. things. Which is like, comment, share, subscribe, all that shit. And I am finally fucking outie. Jesus Christ, this went for a long time. Goodbye.